Thank you, Al. I, just a couple quick announcements. I immediately ran out and got the phone after I heard that we had a crisis down at the riverbank. Bob Gosvick will be here next week with 300 photos of Bismarck's oil spill. <laughs> And a few garbage trucks, too, just so we remember. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the fellow from the Capitol is going to come and make sure we get rid put it in the right place. <laughs> as a young Rotarian, uh, 11 years ago, as I joined Bismarck Rotary, I heard stories about a program that Dr. Schmink presented. And uh, it's taken me about 11 years to get Dr. Schmink on the program. And I'm delighted to be able to uh, uh, introduce Dr. Schmink. Before I do that, I'd like to set the stage. I'd like you to, if you uh, can imagine this, those of us that weren't around at this time and those of you that were can probably recall some of this, but I'd like you to put yourself back to May 31, 1942. And uh, going on at that time in Great Britain, had a massive raid, 130 planes uh, from the Allied forces attacked Cologne, Germany. The raid was timed so that a bomb, that a plane was over Cologne every six seconds. But in 1942 were dark days for the Allied forces. Moving to 1943, May 30, Allied planes blasted airports, communication docks, factories at uh, Zerbergaten, Brussel in Belgium, Vesken in the Netherlands, and in Cherbourg, France. Spitfires fought a running battle with about 30 German aircraft. Washington disclosed the sinking of four Nazi submarines that attacked a convoy, and Washington reported that radar was a major breakthrough and innovation for the Allied forces. The Japanese battleship had been sunk more than eight miles away. Again, 1943, Though for the continent of Europe, dark days. And during that whole period, our own Rotarian, a past president of Bismarck Rotary, a physician that joined the QR clinic in 1956, was in his motherland and had an opportunity to witness an experience that few of us can imagine. Uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Schmink. Dr. Correct you, it's fatherland and mother stone. Today is Memorial Day, and uh, we have celebrated here already a couple of days ago, but all over Europe it is still celebrated now. In Western Europe, there are acres and acres of cemeteries where the Allied forces are buried that liberated Europe in two big wars. And they are Americans, Canadians, British, Australians, New Zealanders, black people from all colonies. And it is, an, it is a fantastic sight when you see all those cemeteries when you go there. The peoples of Europe have taken on the care of these cemeteries. And I've seen it in Holland. The, on Memorial Day, whole schools go there, get classes in what happened, and are, are told who liberated them and why. The more conflict we read in the paper between the policy of Europe and the United States, the more it comes to the fore, the stronger this movement gets. Because even though uh, America and Europe don't agree on most things, Europeans do not want to forget what the Allies did for them during the First World War. It has been said that England and America are separated by a common language. <laughs> and similarly, one may say that America and Europe are separated by the same ideals expressed in different ways. Eric Hopper, the well-known longshoreman from San Francisco, wrote once, in normal times, it perhaps can be said, happy is the nation that has no history. 
But when a Hitler or a Stalin or a Genghis Khan destroyed the world, it fares ill with a people that has no defiant ancestors to commune with and does not feel the throb of their indomitable spirit in his veins. This was experienced in many European countries. Prior to the Second World War, there was a strong peace movement. This prevented England and France from rearming while Germany had a free hand. Hmm? Not a man and not a penny was the common uh, slogan in the Allied countries. Then as now, there was also a drive to replace all kind of martial, martial national hymns with songs praising the beauty of the country and the goodness of the people. They haven't lasted. Churchill and the Gaul were the only voices crying in the wilderness. Churchill was considered to be a devious politician and a spokesman for the arms industry. The Gaul was not so well known even trusted less. He was the man who wrote the book on tank warfare in 1934, which the French general staff dismissed as a joke, and the Germans promptly implemented. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing happened here in 1941, when the Japanese used a plan developed by, an, by a student in the Air Force Acad uh, uh, Academy, how to bomb Pearl Harbor without being detected. I had the good fortune to be young and single during World War II and to get caught up in the Dutch underground resistance movement. It was exciting and scary at the same time. We were all chickens at heart, but adrenaline overcomes fear. Some of us performed heroic feats without realizing it. Life and freedom become very precious once you are in danger of losing them acutely. To say the least, uh, what kind of people joined this resistance movement? To say the least, it was an unusual bunch. Many of them were victims of the depressions, of the studies, and felt frustrated. All of a sudden, they found an outlet for all their energies and saw a chance for self-fulfillment. Others were adventurers. Many of those did not last or survive. Then there were some undesirables. From a political point of view, they were on the one side Marxist and anarchist, and on the other side the strict Calvinist and the, and the uh, Catholics. They all got along fine as long as their goals were the same. <laughs> In retrospect, there were three keys to success. The first one is you have to have the support of the population, either active or tacit. The second one, and that was the downfall for most groups, was strict secrecy. No talking, huh? loose lips sink ship, it was said here in the war, and uh, many ships were sunk during that time. Hmm? And the, second, the third one was no records. A lot of people just love to keep lists of names and addresses, and the Gestapo sure liked it. Hmm? The Gestapos were professional, we were amateurs. I happened to be in three groups that had uh, excellent leaders hmm? and were responsible, mature people. Holland hadn't been in the war for 125 years. Mentally, we were totally unprepared for it. Being a nation of traders, we always try to stay neutral. In the war between France and Germany in 1870, we had even given up Luxembourg to stay out of it. In World War I, we had a very strong army and a strong navy, and besides the Germans were interested in keeping the port of Rotterdam open for their own supplies. There was a large, will, large amount of goodwill towards the Germans in Holland. Germany had never been invading us. We, Napoleon had overrun us. 
The British were our rivals in world trade. We had had at least six wars with the British over the last 200 years. And then in the Boer War in South Africa, the British <coughs> used ruthless oppression. And since they were by origin Dutch people, they didn't sit very well. Before World War II, we tried to, rem uh, to remain neutral again, but the military picture had changed. Two days before Hitler ordered his troops into Poland, we <coughs> mobilized, and this was a feat of bureaucratic organization. It was just impressive. 144,000 men and 14,000 horses were taken to their stations in 24 hours and after that, normal train service resumed. Bureaucracy in Holland is, an, uh, is a very respectable business, and they are efficient. This was also going to be our downfall in many ways, because as the Germans got hold of it, they used it to the full, and we spent a whole year messing it up. This falsification of records, printing new records, uh, making all kind of forms for people to work in Germany with the name of all the collaborators on it. Huh? And uh, uh, it, was, it was fun. When the war broke out, I lived on a farm very close to the German border. And the next evening I was in Hoorn, a uh, picturesque port on the South Sea in an infantry uniform. The uniform fitted perfectly, but the barrel of my 1895 rifle was crooked. <laughs> <laughs> the sergeant explained that I was meant to shoot around corners with the help of mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> the infantry didn't get, hold much appeal for me. 25 mile marches with 60 pounds pack made me feel like a donkey. And as the emblem of my student fraternity was the elephant jumbo, I, had, I asked for a transfer to the medical corps. The undersecretary of the army was a friend of the family, which helped to expedite things. So soon I found myself in uniform as a medical student in Amsterdam, free of tuition and with a weekly allowance besides. It was a good life. It took till May 1940 before militarily anything happened. And then it took only a week before we were totally overrun. The bombardment of Amsterdam, of Rotterdam and Middelburg affected the surrender of the army. The <coughs> Navy and the Merchant Marine had gone out to sea and were beyond the reach of the Germans. After we saw Rotterdam burning and uh, knew that it was over, we quickly got out of uniform, hmm? hid for a couple of weeks, and after that went home. So we avoided becoming prisoners of war. The Queen and the government barely escaped to England on a couple of submarines. And uh, the reaction of the people wasn't that favorable to it. But pretty soon it was recognized that it was a smart move. And uh, we had never been brought up to think of the Kingdom of the Netherlands as an important and powerful country. Holland's only one-fifth of the size of North Dakota, has 10 million people, but we were also the third biggest empire in the world in area, population, world trade, and financial power. And we had a strong navy and a large merchant marine, and this proved be a proved to be a very valuable asset in the future conduct of the war. It gave the government an exile bargaining power in dealing with Churchill and Roosevelt. De Gaulle didn't have any of these trump cards, even, as, even if he was as militant as Queen Wilhelmina was. Did we hate the Germans after they had overrun it? Us. Nobody really expressed it. Everybody was disoriented. The bottom has dropped out of our existence. And the Germans didn't behave the way they were supposed to. 
according to the news report of Poland. They did not kill, they did not plunder, they did not rape, they didn't go after our girls, they brought their own prostitutes. In the evening, the troops would park in the squares with their trucks and tanks, displaying silent power and playing music, singing songs like German armies have done for centuries. This added to our confusion. Then they bought everything that was inside. And they paid promptly for it in our currency. It took us a little while to find out that they had control of our money printing presses. <laughs> and <laughs> there was no shortage of money. Huh? It took some time before the picture became clear. What they wanted was to befriend us as fellow Teutons, Teutons, forget the short war, and join them in the fight against the wicked British and uh, French. Well, we didn't go fight for that. Churchill gave his speeches over the radio, and so did Queen Wilhelmina. Churchill's motto was, in war, resolution, in defeat, defiance, in victory, magnanimity, in peace, goodwill. He gave us the inspiration we needed, and then the Battle of Britain excited us beyond anything that had happened in the recent past. The spirit of defiance became suddenly manifest when the Germans went after the Jews. The Dane had whisked their Jews off to Sweden in one night from the island of Schelland on the other side with all little sailboats, motorboats, and that was an, uh, a masterpiece of organization. Hitler was furious, and he decided that something similar was not going to happen in Holland, and he went after, the, he gave his Gestapo and SS orders to round up the Jews in one or two days, which they did. The Jews in, in Holland live mostly in one area of the city, the prosperous area. The streetcar going there is still called the Jerusalem Express, and that was not meant in a derogatory way. Hmm? The Jews had held a position in Holland that was quite unusual from any place else. These were Sephardic Jews that came out of Spain and Portugal. They had, in the Moorish Empire, they had held a high position. And when Ferdinand and Isabella conquered the rest of Spain and started to institute the Inquisition, they uh, were expelled or they fled. And since Holland had a lot of contact with Lisbon, they could come by ship, and they all came to Amsterdam and were welcomed. It didn't take them long to get the same high positions in Holland. And they always have had these bankers, merchant princes, traders, uh, and public servants. They distinguished themselves so well that after the Napoleonic War, many of them were offered nobility, but uh, since it's not compatible with being Jewish, they refused. The reason for this is, uh, is in the Calvinist theology. You know, in uh, Catholic and, and Lutheran countries, Jews have had trouble. But Calvin uh, taught very uh, directly that the Jews were God's chosen people, God does not make mistakes, and doesn't change his mind. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> and that's that. We were in school already. We were brought up to respect Jews. We didn't have to like them personally, though. Hmm? And they held the same position as they do now in New Amsterdam, hmm? which you erroneously call New York. Hmm? <laughs> <coughs> You know, Holland, as I say, is a Calvinistic country, and Calvinism pervades society like the water dominates the landscape. Even the Catholics think like Calvinists. And that's the reason why the Pope has so much trouble with them. When Pope John Paul visited Holland five years ago, his own Catholic people told him that he wasn't invited and not very welcome. Yeah. 
the roundup of the Jews in Amsterdam caused an immediate and total strike of the population. Even the people who sell herring and flowers all struck. Because the Germans didn't tolerate that and uh, they put it down with a lot of bloodshed. Hmm? Another source for the defiance that developed came from history. Bill Holland had an independence war that lasted 80 years from 1568 to 1648. And that started when the Spanish King Philip II uh, turned the Inquisition loose upon the population of the Low Countries. Uh, up till the Holocaust, this was considered one of the cruelest things that had happened in known history. We relived that history. Books came out, everybody read it. And it was so intense that after the war, when one of the royal princesses married a Spanish prince, she was forced to renounce her right and her titles and uh, prerogatives. And she was one of the most popular ones of the four. The underground resistance movement initially involved only about 5% of the people. This increased to 20% in 1943, when the Germans really showed their cards and, and showed what they were after. And another 60% of the population supported them. 5% supported the Germans, and they were agents, informers, soldiers on the eastern frontier and uh, Gestapo men. Since we all didn't always know who they were, they caused an awful lot of trouble. After the war, 150 of those collaborators were arrested, 40 were executed, 6,000 lost their citizenship, and the rest of them have been reabsorbed in society. It had become clear that they were not that bright and not mean at heart. We had a neighbor on the farm who was a Nazi, and when during the height of the war, uh, we were hiding 28 people on our uh, farm, of which 10 were Allied pilots, he came to my father and he said, you know, I see all those people there on your farm, and I see they are not Dutchmen. Be careful, we don't want you to get caught. So my father stood up for him after the war, and he kept his farm, and uh, everybody had forgotten about it. There were also a lot of people that worked in Germany because of the high unemployment, and they were all making Volkswagens. The trouble was that these Volkswagens all turned out to be tanks and trucks, huh? every one that was finished. <laughs> the total losses that Holland sustained during the war were substantial, 223,000. Population-wise, that would compare with 3 million here. Hmm? 102,000 of those were Jews. 7,000 died in uh, military service, 23,000 in bombardment, uh, 70,000 from starvation or the effect of uh, starvation, 2,000 by execution. Only Poland, Russia, and Germany have had higher losses. That as an introduction. Everybody who wants to leave should leave, huh, because it may Time. You know, in 1943, uh, I had come from home because I, in 42 I was busy with this uh, falsification of all kind of ration cards and picking up uh, uh, registers of population registration and putting them away in, in hiding places. And all of a sudden, one evening, uh, I came home and my mother said, you better, you better disappear. Because what had happened is my name had gotten on some list and uh, uh, the Gestapo was looking for me. And the local constable came by on his bicycle and he said with an absolutely straight face to my mother, he said, tomorrow morning I will be here with the German authorities to arrest your son and left. He was, uh, he was a good man, but he had to play both sides, of course. So the next morning he was there with the German authorities, and I wasn't there. 
course. <laughs> I had gone to Amsterdam because the big city is the place to hide. You can hide in the big city much easier than than on uh, in the country. Uh, I decided to uh, to pursue my uh, next degree in medicine, and uh, I attended some classes in bacteriology on a Saturday morning. And all of a sudden, we were surrounded by the SS, and 1,500 of us were rounded up. We didn't know why, but it turned out that a student in Holland had killed General Seifert, that was the Dutch general of the, the Nazi battalion at the Eastern Front. Well, we were uh, all herded into uh, schools, and uh, we had a speech by the router, the the top man of the Gestapo, he was pretty humorous too. And then we went uh, with a train to a concentration camp. I'd never been in a first class train before, but this was first class. And uh, we were herded into that uh, concentration camp, we had to march a couple of miles. And over the entrance of the concentration camp, it said, Arbeit macht frei. Freedom makes you, makes you free. <laughs> uh, uh, work makes you free. Well, we found out about that freedom as we came in. We came into barracks that had been vacated by the Jews, and we found uh, boiled potatoes under the, under the pillows, huh? and uh, uh, all the things that they had left behind, which was pretty, quite pitiful. Hmm? And uh, we spent there about a couple of months. We were all students. We were treated as hostages rather than like inmates, because most of, or not most of them, but a lot of the parents of these boys had held high positions in Holland. And the Germans needed some of their collaboration, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they got it. And so they got it in exchange for our freedom. All of a sudden, in May, we were released. We were told that we should report to the uh, employment bureau to register for Germany, to work in Germany. And uh, quite a few did, because their parents were scared. Well, I came home, and my father said, of course you're not going. Hmm? So we had, our farm was uh, remote, and it had two access roads. At the uh, first crossroad of, the, of one of these roads was the post office, there was a man sitting, and he would uh, call quickly if he saw some convoy come our way that looked suspicious, and on the other side there was a convoy too, so we had an ideal hiding places. We also had, an, uh, had their uh, barges on the canals that uh, went through it, plus shacks, and I spent the next couple of months sleeping in a shack with uh, rats and mice and, uh, and uh, all kind of things. And of course I was looking for something to do. It was also the time that the Allied uh, airplanes were coming over. I remember one morning counting 1,500 going over our house. We were just on the flyway to, to Hamburg and Bremen. And the Germans were still strong and they uh, they uh, sent out the fighters, and one day, I wasn't there, but one day my brother said, he saw 17 fall, 17 Allied planes. Hmm? So there were a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, people who were in those planes floating around on parachutes, hiding. Most of them were caught by the Germans, of course, but not all of them. And uh, uh, so we were all looking for one. In the summer after the harvest, my brothers and I had built beautiful bunkers to hide in. We had a large barn, a couple of hundred feet long, and uh, uh, 100 feet wide, and, and 50 feet high, a huge barn, and it was packed with those bales of straw. Straw was just as valuable then as, as grain was. And while we were packing that straw in, we made our hiding places with gangways to it, shooting galleries, and uh, we were, we lived there in comfort and luxury. Hmm? There was, at the end of it, there was always one of those bales that had to go in and close it off, so that you could close it off from the inside as well as from the outside, in case the Germans would come, and since the, 
the, the building was with wood, we had signs to let us know whether we shouldn't come out or should come out by knocking on that wood. So uh, we had an ideal place for, uh, for hiding people. And uh, so it happened in November 43. I was sitting in the living room, looking out over both these roads, and all of a sudden I saw a guy on a parachute drift by. It was very windy, it was not nice weather, and I quickly went outside. I thought, oh, he's going to end up in Germany, as the wind is, but I grabbed my bicycle and went after it in the direction where he, uh, where he seemed to come down, and fortunately he was on this side of the border. The, Headmaster of the school was already there, and so he said to him, ask him who he was, and he said he was uh, Tom Hubbard from Fort Worth. We had no idea where Fort Worth was. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what do you want? He said, I want to go back to the States. <laughs> so that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Yo, it was just that day that I had uh, read in the paper that uh, the mayor, with uh, a whole bunch of, uh, of his uh, gang would come to inspect certain things and uh, would be in the area of there. He was a Nazi and we knew that the Germans were looking for all these people that had come down uh, fiercely. So it was in the afternoon, the fellow had a little sore knee and bloodshot eyes and I said, you have to go into hiding because I can't do anything with you now. And since we live close to those peat barges, you know, from ancient times, there have, have been a large peat bog separating Holland and Germany. It kept, uh, it kept uh, virus from getting from Amsterdam to Hamburg, and it kept the Germans out for many centuries. Now, this, these peat bogs have been uh, cut down, and uh, the marshes have been uh, drained, and farms are there now all. But there is a lot of peat left, and we use it for, uh, for burning in stoves. Every year it's cut and stands to dry in those, in those uh, stacks, and they are haphazard. So I said to him, say, there's that peat bog, you hide in there, and you come back here tonight at 8 o'clock. Uh, he said, watch is the same, and it's dark, and I'll be back here. Hmm? So he got in there, he was an intelligent guy. And so he got in his speed bog, and in the evening I went back, see whether he was there. And he said, yeah, there he was, standing right next to me. So I took him to our bunker in the, in the barn, and we got the doctor out to look at his injuries. It wasn't serious. And uh, we settled and talked, and uh, and. Uh, over the next three weeks, we taught him how to be a Dutchman. <laughs> that was difficult, you know. You know, a Texan walks like this. Now these walk like this. <laughs> a lot of the English had been caught because they were walking on the, le on the left side of the street. <laughs> so, he was a good student. And... Uh, the local doctor was in, uh, that wasn't, that's another story all by itself, but he was one of our firm helpers. And he was the only one who at that time had hot water and soap and alcohol. So we, in the evening, he would come with his car via the back road, pick him up, take him to his house, give him a bath, entertain him. And uh, uh, even one morning he made all his rounds with him sitting next to him. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he was a brave man. So after uh, after three, four weeks, he was ready to be pronounced Dutch. And so I told him what was going to happen. I was going to take him on the train with false papers, with my father's clothes and head, and I was going to bring him, bring him to the border with Belgium. And there he would be arrested by a group of people in Nazi uniform. And they would take him across the border and then put him on a train to Brussels. 
That's the way the underground works. It's just like the mafia here. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and because uh, we came to that railroad station, and there were three trains coming together, and he was sitting on that bench, and all of a sudden out of the other train came a whole battalion of SS men. He looked at me and I said, okay, huh? So he got his, uh, his cigarette paper and his tobacco out and rolled the cigarette like all Dutchmen do and sat there, sat there uh, as if he belonged there. So he took him to the border and left him there and he was arrested in the train and said, if they ask you for the paper, you just do this, huh? hand it to them and they hand it back like you do with a ticket. If they ask you questions, you're sunk. Huh? It worked. And I, he gave me his parachute handle and his valuables and his parachute, in which my sister got married the next year. <laughs> and uh, I buried it in the yard and put a marker on it. He said, I'm an only child. And my mother is an, uh, is an manager of a department store in Fort Worth. Would you send her this after the war? because I may not make it. So, I said, well, and if you make it to London, which wasn't all that sure, let me know on Radio Orange with this slogan. Give him a slogan. I never heard it. And so I assumed that he had gotten picked up somewhere along the way. But he did make it. He made it to Brussels, to France. He had to fight his way through the Pyrenees, and he got to Lisbon and to England in a rather short time. Only the radio refused to give the message because, you know, they said, how do we know that it isn't a German message? And so I assumed he hadn't made it. So the war was over, and I sent all his belongings to his mother in Fort Worth uh, with a note. And, you know, it didn't take very long. I got a call from London where he was. And he said, did you all make it through the war? I said, yeah, did you too? He said, yeah, I got there. And uh, so we didn't see him at that time. We exchanged a few letters, and he sent some coffee and cigarettes and all these things. Huh? And uh, so then I came to this country in 52, and Birgit, my wife, came in 53. As we made the, the, the route of the country after an, uh, on a vacation, of course, we went to Fort Worth and stopped at him. And so he knew all of us. Huh? And, uh, he was an air controller then in uh, Fort Worth, and uh, he was as nice as he had been before. He had one daughter. Hmm? He had written up a story of what happened to him from the time he fell down, and I, up till now, I, I've read it once when I was at his house, and uh, I've, I've tried to get hold of it. I wanted him, with him to appear here one day together and tell the story, but he had died in, uh, a couple of years ago. And I can't get that story out of his daughter. He can't find it, she says. Uh, came, my wife and I both went back to Holland and Denmark, and we got married in Denmark. And I went back to my residency, making $175 a month. And this was not enough to sponsor her, of course. And uh, I had used up all the money they had brought when I came, so there was no way of getting it done. So I thought, well, I'll just wait till I'm done with my residency and have an, a job somewhere and I can sponsor her. So it was in November 55 uh, that he called me. He said, it's, it's 12 years since you picked me up in that field. I didn't know that. And so he inquired how big it was and how uh, told him we were married and she said, where is she? He said, well, she's in, uh, she's in Denmark still. She's waiting for a visa and uh, she's having some trouble. Oh, he said, that's too bad. Huh? That's too bad, as a Texan would say. And he didn't say anything more. Hmm? So a week later, Birgit called and said, you know, my visa is all in order. And Tom Hubbard arranged it via his congressman, 
Jim Wright of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> So, Jim Wright is our sponsor, <laughs> and we are very, very grateful to him. And uh, that was the end of that story. Hmm? Stand for any questions from our audience? Oh, yeah. Sure. Questions? Yes. Peter, why was there so much violence in Poland? I don't know, but uh, the Germans and the Poles never have gotten along. The Germans are very condescending of the Polish, that I know. And, uh, uh, why they were so much meaner than they were initially to us. Later on, they were mean to us, too. But that didn't start until after 1943. You know, they would round up people. I remember sitting at home and hearing some shots, looking out of the window, four people in a park just shot to death. They, uh, uh, they shot, in the beginning, in 42 or 43, they shot five prominent citizens. One of them was the uncle, uh, was Van Heemstar, the uncle of Audrey Hepburn. And he just happened to be a, a, a friend of mine uh, because we were in the same uh, student fraternity. Then they had an, uh, a group of uh, 18 that were executed and a group of 72. That group of 18 was uh, there was a poet among them by the name of Jan Kampert. And when the German sent all his belongings to his wife, she searched it and found in the seam of one of his uh, uh, coats a, a poem that was then published in the underground paper. And that really uh, was an uh, outstanding thing. It goes something like that. A cell is about three meters wide and barely two meters uh, three meters long and barely two meters wide. Even smaller is the piece of land that I don't know about yet, but where I'll be buried tomorrow. He said, I and 18 of my friends, none of us will see the evening light. And then it goes on. It's a beautiful poem in Dutch. And uh, this was published. You know, the, the, the press, the press was fantastic. The, the, the official press was total, totally servile from the start. They had no guts. But then came the underground press, and then the, the British uh, distributed a lot of things over uh, by air. And because uh, it costed a lot of lives, these presses were found. And, uh, and uh, not only confiscated, but the people were shot. Some way or other, there were... I always knew that I would make it during the, or through the war. And my whole family has made it. And I ascribe that to guardian angels. But in 1944, I was doing something with, uh, with a fellow by the name of Joop Deunders. He was from Indonesia. And, you know, a group of us had uh, captured uh, an... Uh, load of barges that were going to be towed to Germany. And we had captured them and emptied them out and floated them on the river at A in Amsterdam because we had total control of the water police with our mafia. And so I got one of those wagon wheel cheese, you know, Gouda cheese, and it was, it was young. And so I said to this guy, I said, you know, I'm not going to eat mine because the next half year will be the toughest, and I want to save it. And he said, I'm going to eat it now, because in half a year I won't be here. And we ran across that a lot. A lot of people knew that they wouldn't make it. And whether they were seeking death, or you, you didn't know. But 
My whole family got out of this without any trouble. But in the village itself, you know, where they didn't have these hiding places that we had, 25 out of 500 got shot. One day the Germans came to the farm and uh, searched the whole place. They found two two people that were just hiding from working Germany, but that's what that's not what they were looking for. They didn't even take them along. And uh, as they were uh, searching the house, my father was making fun of them. He said, "Don't forget to look in that closet because there's one hiding, and don't look and look behind that door." And then they came to a door that was locked. And they said, why is the door locked? She said, well, my daughter lived there and she's a teenager and she locks her room apparently, but you can kick it in if you want to. They didn't. And that was good because on the table there were several pistols lying, which, was, <laughs> which would have costed him his life immediately. You know, he, he was very supportive. You know, we didn't know the danger all involved, but the parents did. And he always said to us, same as what I imagine all of, uh, Reagan said to all of us, do whatever you want, but keep me out of it. <laughs> 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 and we did. He didn't know, he didn't know a thing, and he, he made it a point not to know anything. You know, in the last organization where I was in, it was a group of 600 people, and it was so organized by, a, by an, an very adequate leader. We were supplying the Western Horn with, uh, with weapons in case of an invasion to have everybody armed. And there were 600 men, and only five <coughs> of the 10 at the top uh, got killed just by individual accidents. And the, others, the other 595 were all there at the end of the war. And we had to rule you know the fellow above you, you know the fellow below you, and you don't ask questions. And we had our headquarters in the house of a German lady that we could trust, and she had a house with four stories, and we said, we want the top story, rent the second and third story out to German officers, and live yourself at the bottom. You were most you are most safe in the in the in the house of the enemy. Also, once uh, when I went uh, was to deliver a message to uh, a fellow that I didn't know uh, in the Hague, I said, "Where is it?" He said, "It's in the Peace Palace." I said, "Well, that's the German headquarters." They said, "Precisely. You ask for John, hmm? and you give him this verbal message, and this is the password to get past the to get past the, the soldiers." It worked beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Next week, it's Tom Powers, our state warden. It'll be here in the far west room, not in the Benton room, but here in the...